So one thing I, I forgot to mention, hopefully you guys all saw this last week, I, for the course of this year and maybe into the future, I've started to put a series of questions for you to think through and to talk through um, after the message. So it's on the back of your uh, sermon guide. So I just I would strongly encourage you um, to really dig into those questions. Um, so with that in mind, let's turn to... Uh, Genesis. Darkness makes simple things harder to accomplish. It, concer- it conceals that which is discernible in the light. Back in 1998, my family and I went on a spring break trip to Tennessee. It was a memorable and cherished trip for a number of reasons. But one experience sticks with me most. On our way home, we decided to go down into a cavern. I was excited about seeing something new, but also fearful of the thought of feeling trapped underground. We walked quite a distance with a group and a guide. Reminders that this cavern had been used by the Confederates during the Civil War were revealed by messages scrawled on the walls, and even one cannon that had been left behind. At one point, we had to cross a natural bridge, and it was unsettling to say the least. Eventually, we, we walked to a place where there was kind of an open space, well lit thanks to modern electricity. Suddenly, the light went out. Now, if you ever, or when you've had that experience of walking into your bedroom at night and you flip the light switch off, initially it's dark. But if you've never been in a cavern that's dark, you don't understand darkness. I've never been in a place near as dark as that moment in life. My stomach churned as I realized I couldn't even see my hands. Now, our guide told us Stay calm, because he was familiar with this cavern. He said, it's going to take us some time, but you can trust me to return us all safely. Even still, my legs stuck to the floor like lead weights welded to the ground. My mind was racing as I realized that my well-being was beholden to the stranger. Could I really trust him? Now last week, we set off on a year-long journey reading and preaching through the Bible. And I pray that your journey has started off well. And I want to second what Betsy said, that I want to encourage you. A, it's not too late to start, but yeah, this is, we need to be in the Word. There is still our copies of the Read Through the Bible plan on the table back there, and you can find them on the website as well. Now, before we start, I want to encourage you to visit the website if you have not seen last week's sermon. It was absolutely foundational to everything that is in the Word. Remember that we talked about how Genesis 1 through 11, you really can't understand the fullness of Scripture unless you understand all that took place in the beginning. So go back and watch that. You don't have to, you don't have to turn your, your minds off and go do that now. You can still watch it later, but it is vital that you do so. But last week, just kind of a high point, a highlight point, the sermon in a sentence, remember that we focused on needing to understand how to hit the bullseye of the target. And that in order for us to do that, scripturally speaking, We must understand where the aim and release point is of your arrow. That if you release your arrow off just a little bit, the fraction of an inch, your arrow is going to miss. And so we talked about the fact that in the gospel, or in the word, we must understand that aim and release point. That aim and release point being, what is the nature of sin? 
And so we summarized it this way. The accurate diagnosis of sin in our lives is a kingdom or leadership issue. We saw how Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent to distrust God's loving leadership. And instead, I heard this word, these words used by a couple of you that even this morning as you shared, that we were led to trust ourselves. Now where we left off with them last week was that they were, we didn't mention this in the sermon, but you're going to find that I'm not preaching verse by verse this year, but I'm going to try to hit on some of the events that happened. We found them in shame about what they had done. They had traded the very good that God had created for the presence of evil, for choice, for control. Now we refer to this as the fall of man. And that there was an unintended consequence of their choices. That everything was stained, tainted by sin. They were cast out of Eden into a world filled with darkness. Now in this week's reading, I want to just emphasize things that probably many of you are very well aware of. But just to kind of summarize a lot of what Betsy was alluding to. It didn't take long for man's wickedness to show up. Here's a real, real quick rundown of the things that you should have come across in your reading. In jealousy, Cain killed Abel. The wickedness became so bad that God sent a flood in a reset of humanity, saving only Noah and his family. Men attempted to build their own kingdom in one place, at the Tower of Babel, so as to make a name for themselves in direct defiance of God's command for them to spread out over the world and multiply. There, were, there was war, sexual sins, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, illegitimate children, Abram lying to try to, to save his skin, the deceitfulness and stealing by Jacob, to name just a few. And nothing has changed. Sin is still used in an effort to leverage control. We should all be aware and knowledgeable about the attempts that are being made by Satan even to this day. This is kind of a side note. This is something that I've come across more recently. But I think it's important to understand that Satan works in many counterfeit ways. This is what makes temptation and sin so difficult for us. Because one, it's tempting... And two, it is not always a blatant lie. So I want to just, in, in, in lieu of the, this idea of being aware of the signs of our time and how, how Satan shows himself to work in these counterfeit, close ways, I want you to be mindful of the fact that we are living in a world that is seeking what is being called the Great Reset. You may or may not be aware of this. I'm not going to delve into that this morning. But I want you to catch that. We were told that the days in the end would be as they were in the days of Noah. And what did God do? We know what humanity was doing, and we're seeing, we've seen that throughout the ages. But God reset humanity. Be mindful of the signs of the times. Understand, have a hunger to learn first and foremost what's in the Word, but also don't close your mind off to the things that are happening in our world. The depth of the darkness of man is so deep that we can't fully comprehend it. We dig ourselves into a pit that is so hard and so deep because of our sin. And yet, even though we know how deep, of, uh, how quick and uh, prone we are to sin, ask yourself this question. I'm going to phrase this as a question instead of a statement. How often do you hesitate before you trust in your own thoughts or your own actions? 
believing them to be wise. I'll admit, some thought comes across my mind, and my first thought is, that's got to be the truth. I believed it after all, right? God gave that to me. No, my first place of discernment then is, is this true, compatible with God's word? But people trust in themselves implicitly, without as much of a second thought. And yet, trusting in the God of the universe who created it, who is perfect, seems foolish. If you ask, if, if, if I went around, I'm not going to do this, by the way, I don't want to scare you off of me, but if I, this week, decided that I was going to find each one of the people that knew you best, and I asked them one question, who would they say that you trust? Our text this morning is Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 17. Just one verse in chapter 12, but it says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed by you, or through you. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us, and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, But me, my covenant is with you. You will be an ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you, and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be, with, I will be your God and your descendants, God after you. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are immigrants, the whole land of Canaan, as an enduring possession, and I will be their God. Now in Genesis 17.1, the second verse there, it's real clear who God considers to be trustworthy. It's the one who walks with God. Now our character is revealed by our actions and where they confirm, whether they confirm our words or not. To be trustworthy, someone must be counted as truthful. How quick we are to break our word, covenants, or I'm sorry, contracts, and even our marriage covenants with ease. Very rarely does death result as a response. <coughs> In our text, we see that God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham to give him many descendants. And I'm not going to hit much on this right now, but I want you to know that when covenants were made with the Hebrew people, one's very life depended upon holding true to their word. Now what I put on your sermon outline is a link uh, that you can go to that has a resource that pretty nicely lays out the steps that were involved in ancient covenant making. And, not surprisingly, you'll find in maybe a slightly different form, you'll understand some of the things maybe that you didn't about why we do what we do with our marriage ceremonies. But I want to mention one, of, one thing, and that, and that is this, that part of the covenant making was that after a covenant was agreed upon, each, they, would, they would spill the blood of a lamb on the ground and then each member would walk a figure eight through the blood. It was a sign that if either party broke their part of the consent of the covenant, their blood was to be shed as payment. God's character shines through because he always has stayed true to his promises, and he has never, nor will he ever, break one. It's for that reason alone that we can trust his word and what he tells us about all things. The ultimate issue in this world is leadership. Who you follow and what you follow directs your life. That is the single most important thing about you. 
If you were to tell me who your leader was, who you follow, there are all sorts of conclusions that I could rightfully make. Even if your leader is yourself, which is what most of us really want and how we often live. It's important to understand that in our secret, real, inner inclinations, we need to ask the question, where am I going? Where is my life headed? Who you are following will determine where you are going. Are you guided by fear or guilt or shame? Or are you guided by the word of God? Are you guided by pride? Some sense that I can do things on my own. I don't need help. I don't need God. The crux of the matter at its very core is this. Do you believe that God is trustworthy? That he has your best in mind? Do you trust him? Because he said so? Or do you find that you are often like the clay, always needing to question and challenge the potter? In other words, is God worth following? If he is, why don't you follow him? What would happen in this world if people followed Christ? What would happen in your specific world, your area of influence, if you were faithful in all that God commanded? My sermon in a sentence is this. Man breaks his word on a whim. God keeps his word in spite of man's whims. When sin entered the world... It stained every aspect of our world. It holds power over us, or over those without Christ. And the very presence of sin marks us for death. We deserve nothing other than death. But out of God's infinite love, he not only fulfilled his part of the covenant, he fulfilled our part too. Because of this, God has provided a way out if we submit to his authority and obey his teachings. First, when we submit to God's authority in our lives, it saves us from the stain of sin. Have you ever tried to remove a difficult stain from a shirt? I usually just throw mine away. But Which are the most difficult stains to remove? Coffee? Ink? Ketchup, okay? Perhaps after being able to re, to re, unable to remove it, you just threw it away. The Bible teaches us that sin is a filthy stain that we are unable to clean for ourselves. Because of the original sin of Adam and Eve, all humanity finds itself stained by sin. What is this stain? It's the guilt and the shame that even our own children recognize. Now consider this story. Mike and Tanya had a five-year-old daughter named Lisa. They had taught her to respect her pastor. She prayed every night for him, and after each Sunday service, she would give him a hug. One Sunday morning, she smiled and said, I have something special for you, Pastor. She handed him a $5 bill and leaned real close and whispered, Now, Pastor, don't spend it on McDonald's. The pastor laughed at her good-humored teasing. But as he was reflecting on that event that afternoon, he came to a deeper realization. All over the world, people are deeply affected by the failure of our human leaders. Weary cynical, and even hardened by the uncountable abuses by those in authority. In such a world, is it any wonder why even a five-year-old would know that money entrusted to a leader doesn't always end up where it's designated? 
Unfortunately, man's solution to this problem has come in the form of religion. Religion is man's attempt to clean ourselves up. We want to change our vocabulary and follow a bunch of rules in attempt to do good so that we can appease a higher power. It is nothing more than a neatly packaged attempt to control God. In Jeremiah, we read that God addresses our inability to cleanse sin stains. He says, though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me. Now, if you don't know this, lye is a strong chemical that can even burn your skin. No matter how harshly we wash ourselves, it is not enough. Though your skins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. In Isaiah we read, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That was that part was from Psalm, excuse me. I can't help but thinking about the story of God testing Abraham. At the Lord's command, Abraham takes his son Isaac and plans to sacrifice him. And at the moment that he's about to do him in, an angel of the Lord says this, Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. God provides a ram for the sacrifice. It is a preview of that which is to come later. Jesus, God's only Son, the spotless Lamb, who has the power over sin, and that he would sacrifice his life for humanity. In Christian circles, we use the word justification. Only God can remove the stain, but we offer him the garment of our lives for cleansing. Because he loves us and interceded for us, we no longer bear sin's stain. He has washed us and made us clean. We long to live a life worthy of this clean, pure robe, free of sin or spattered by sin. Let our lives and actions reflect the truth of the garment that we now wear as a result of a genuine relationship with Christ. Secondly, submitting to God's authority saves us from the power of sin. Before we entrust our lives to Jesus' loving leadership, we are held captive by sin. In John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul wrote, Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And lastly, one probably the most famous of these four that I've referenced is in Romans chapter 3, For the wages of sin is death. Millions have come to a saving relationship with Christ through church services, friends, and families, leading them in a salvation prayer. However, it is not in the words of the prayer that save. Christ alone has the power to save us through faith. Pastor J.D. Greer explains it well. He says, it is not the prayer that saves, it's the repentance and faith behind the prayer that lays hold of salvation. My concern, this is me speaking now, this is not your, my concern is that when we overemphasize the prayer, we often undermine the fact that the primary instruments of our salvation are repentance and faith. You see, the Christian life begins, not ends, when Jesus becomes the Lord and Savior of our lives. When we repent and turn our life to Jesus, The rest of our life is designed that we give more and more control of our lives to the sovereignty of God, so that He is Lord of your life. 
Remember real quickly last week how we talked about we, in the beginning, Adam and Eve trained, tra traded God's leadership in the form of a nice crown in for man's leadership that's like a Burger King crown. We traded the great for evil. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Those are Paul, or as John's words. John, Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus is calling us out of the mindset of self-protection into a life of self-abandonment for the benefit of the gospel. This part of the journey we call sanctification. It is a lifelong journey that we never fully accomplish on this side of eternity. But something worth considering, whether this has crossed your mind or not, I think it's fruitful. I remember the first time I heard it. It's important to note that grace is opposed to earning, not effort. That is to say, we cannot earn God's grace, but when God's grace is freely given... We are not to sit in the pews idly, but to be found at work for the Lord. Learning the blessings of this life, of growing obedience to God's word, is where true joy is. It's the ultimate motivation to set our comfort aside and propel us to live our faith out daily. But let's acknowledge one thing. And on the surface, you're probably going to say, why is he acknowledging the obvious? But underneath this is the realization that we lie to ourselves about this and how we live. And it's this. Let us acknowledge here and now, publicly, that no one here has been or ever will be, aside from Jesus, perfect in this lifetime. No one. So keep listening to this. Why do I belabor this point? Two reasons. We need to stop living our Christian lives in an attempt to cultivate a perception that we have it all together. While in reality, never being willing to step out in faith and serve our Lord. What does this look like? This is revealed in an unwillingness to truly fellowship with one another, to let your guard down, to be honest with each other, to grow together. It reveals itself in not building relationships with others, both in the church and outside, to share the gospel, but instead hiding behind the excuses of comfort or the fear that Satan tries to stop you with. Secondly, since no one is perfect, show grace. When things happen that you don't like, handle it with grace. When things aren't done up to your standards, show grace. Even as I speak, God is at work reconciling the world to himself. Our part's to be available. That's it. We need to be willing to join God where he is at work faithfully. Jesus loved us so much that he laid his life down for us. Are you willing to lay down your life for a family member? Or a friend? A neighbor? What about a crowded group of people gathered together? Jesus did. We grow when we faithfully participate in God's plan for our lives. How freeing it is when you realize that no one rightfully can expect us to be perfect. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. 
We all make mistakes. We understand that here. Let's live it here. God is after authenticity and obedience, even when it gets messy. It's what God is after. He doesn't want your carefully constructed house of cards that you try to keep standing so that everyone thinks you have it together. We have been saved so that we no longer are overpowered by the sinful flesh, but rather we live under the, the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. We now have a better path and the opportunity to live under the leading of the Spirit rather than our flesh. And finally, submitting to God's authority will lead us to be saved from the presence of sin. There is nothing more deadly to the human heart and to our soul than the presence of sin. Even after Jesus paid the penalty and has taken away the power, we are not removed instantaneously from the presence of sin. We are no longer enslaved to the flesh, but we are still capable of getting entangled in sin. Now, I remember a time when I was in college where I first encountered an earwig. They are a slow-moving bug that has no hard shell. Yet no matter, how many of you, you guys engaged, ear, you have earwigs out here? Okay, so you don't even begin to know. They're all, man, they, just, they are a bug that creep me out beyond anything else that I know, bugs. But um, look one up at some point. But this bug, has, there's nothing special about it. I want to emphasize, no shell, no, I mean, there's no hard shell there. Yet every time you, I would step on it to kill it, I never seemed to be able to do it. Each time I would think I'd finally done it. And I tell you what, I was pretty cruel to those things. They, 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 I mean, they would show up in multitudes. But each time I thought I had done it in, I would lift my foot up and there it was, wriggling and moving along. I couldn't seem to put it to death. However, in my research I learned that, ear, that earwigs is, even for how... I couldn't seem to put them to death. They could not live in light, in lighted areas. They thrive on damp and dark areas. The way to put these pernicious bugs to death was by exposing them to light. This example really puts into perspective Apostle Paul's words that say, put to death Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly desires. Putting to death what is in your nature is very difficult. Let's be real about that. There's a reason that those natures still show up in, in us. It's hard. And it's even harder if you've lived with those natures for 40 or 50 or 60 years. But notice what that doesn't say. It doesn't say put to death, therefore, what's in your nature unless it's been in there for this long. There is no clause. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Yet just as is the case with the earwigs, the only way to successfully remove them is to expose it to light. The light found in scripture and the light of truth. Have you ever justified lying as acceptable? Consider the madness that we're seeing in our world, the great delusion that is present. God told us this would happen. The insanity that is taking place through words and actions of men and women is astounding. What do we do? What's our response to this darkness? It is to shine the light of Scripture and truth into the world. The residue of sin still resides in us, but it becomes less and less when we shine the light of Scripture into our lives. As God is sanctifying us, we understand more and more the benefits of living under the authority of a loving God. This is a great journey to be on. It can be frustrating at times because you're having to try to give things up and remove things that are painful. 
but we are working for the good of our Lord. Knowing with hope the best is yet to come. And that best to come is glorification. This is the moment we enter heaven and we know that the presence of sin is no more. We will enjoy eternity with our loving Father in a place where tears will be wiped away. He loves us so much that we have been saved from the stain and the power of sin. And we look forward with great hope in the promise that when Christ returns and we are brought to heaven, that sin will be no more. What a glorious day that will be. God is the faithful leader whom you can trust because of who he is. Even when you feel as though things are lost, that we are in the darkest of places, he knows the way. And he is the light that can guide our path. And so remember, think twice before you trust in the leadership of any man. Because man breaks his word on a whim. But God keeps his word in spite of man's whims. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we recognize all too often we we are too quick to trust ourselves and, and too quick to distrust you. I think of, in the story of the Exodus, how quickly your people would see signs of, and wonders of who you were, but then seemingly within the mo matter of moments, their hearts were hardened to you. And they didn't trust your leading in their life. Lord, I pray that you will work in the hearts of each person here, physically and with us through Zoom. That we would ask ourselves with a serious nature, who are we following? Who leads our life? Lord, each one of us longs to live under your loving and easy authority. Lord, make it clear to us what you want us to do and where you want us to go and teach us to be faithful. Give us a, a mindset of availability or that when things pop up, uh, opportunities to share your word, to build relationships, um, to know you better, Lord, help us not to pass them by out of some sense of convenience. Lord, as we uh, are in the beginning stages of 2021. Lord, this is a, a year for us to rededicate ourselves to, to your word and to you and to doing all that you have commanded. Help us to be found faithful um, upon the day of your return. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the closing song. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power of him who is within us, let him be the glory of the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Remember what I started last week, and I said you're going to hear this most Sundays, church, you are sent. Go and be salt and light this week. Amen.